Welcome to the Common Good Podcast, a conversation about the significance of place, eliminating economic isolation, and the structure of belonging. I'm your host, Rabbi Miriam Turlin Chan. And for this week's conversation, our producer, Joey Taylor, talks with Courtney Napier about her experience being evicted when she was young. Courtney's story follows last week's episode with Bree Newsom Bass, where she discussed the relationship between housing and policing. In addition to being in charge of the Common Good Reader, Courtney is a freelance journalist and writer from Raleigh, North Carolina. As you encounter this story, we invite you to listen with an open heart and avoid assigning fault. We invite you to listen to the story from Courtney's perspective. I was 18 at the time. I think I had turned 18. So at this point in in my life in our family's life uh, my dad had a really 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 great job he was consulting businesses he consulted for ibm and other businesses he's an incredible business mind he was working for himself and i think we were at that point making more money than we ever had as a family so we had one of those suburbans um but it was like pretty pimped out i mean it was like leather interior it had like the screens in the back of the you know headrests. It was perfect for our family. I mean, there there's six of us kids. So it was like the perfect family vehicle. We had bought a flat screen TV when they were like ridiculously expensive and it didn't fit our old TV stand. So then my dad had to go buy a new TV stand. And it was, I mean, it was just like, you know, the house that we were renting was really nice in a great neighborhood, Northwest Raleigh. So a pretty expensive place to live relatively. I don't think any of us really knew what was going on or that there was issues. I, I do know that my dad got to a point where he was gone so much. And I had two brothers, I have two brothers, and they were right at that age where there were some behavior type issues and things of that nature, just kind of pushing boundaries. And my mom was struggling with us because he would travel so much. He would be gone like four days, home three, gone four home three. And so she was kind of struggling to just kind of keep everything together. So he decided to stop consulting and find something different to do. But I think there were just some issues with budgeting and stuff like that. I mean, like for a family that big, that's really hard anyway, but there must have been some issues around that. And and we got behind on our bills, I'm assuming. Again, as a young person, I really didn't know what was going on. And, and so one day, I think a friend um, drove me home from school. I don't think I was with my parents. And I saw the notice on the door and the lock, the big padlock on the door saying that, you know, we've been evicted. We have, we have so much time to get our things. I'm not sure if there was a sheriff there or not, but it was just a very sinking, scary feeling. I think I, you know, had my little Nokia cell phone and called my parents and just like, this is what's happening. What's happening. And yeah, we had to just pack up our stuff and leave that day. And we ended up staying with an aunt and the six of us kids, my parents, my aunt, and my uncle were all in their house for about two weeks. I was just so angry, really, really, really angry. Now that I've had my own experience of being displaced, I understand that there's so many things going on. I mean, rent gets raised. Landlords have an incredible amount of latitude to make choices about their tenants. And now I know that. But at the time, I was just like, this is this is crazy. Like, how could you do this to us? Looking at my parents, just very angry at them. You were more angry at your parents, not at the landlord. Yeah, I did. I really had no concept of a landlord. I really didn't even understand what that relationship was or could be. I understood that we didn't own the home, but I don't I don't think I understood what it meant to be a renter. We had moved a lot as a family. I think I've probably as a kid moved around nine or so times. I understood that we didn't own these homes, but I didn't understand what that meant as far as how our relationship with the home and the capacity to for someone to step in and, and make us leave. I didn't understand that. I didn't see any of that. And so, um, yeah, I was definitely angry at my parents from what I could see. They must have done something wrong to cause us to have to move. Now I understand that's not always how it has to be, but that was how I saw it then. My aunt was able to find us a place and my family stayed in that house for the longest that we've stayed in any house. I think it was about 10 or 12 years that we lived in that house, which was great because it, it was a lot of stability. But I think the deal that we had to make with the landlord was kind of less than ideal. The deal was like, you know, we would fix anything that broke. You know, we wouldn't have you on the line for that. And so as things would break and our 
financial situation as a family was still such that that would be very difficult to address right away. But we, you know, we made do and we were stable. And that was the point, you know, that was what was really important at that time. And now everybody's doing great. <laughs> My parents just bought a house a couple of years ago. We are now homeowners as well. Um, but yeah, that time was very difficult, very confusing as a young person. And then also feeling the need to be strong because I'm the oldest of the six kids. So I didn't really feel like I could talk to anybody about it. I don't think I ever really confronted them about it. I think it was just something that kind of just ended up staying inside of me. You know, I didn't, because I also felt bad for them. You know, I'm sure I knew they were hurt and embarrassed and angry in their own right, you know, maybe for the decisions of the landlord, maybe because of their own decisions, but I could tell this was, this hurt them a lot that this happened and happened to us, happened to their kids. And so I didn't feel like I wanted to talk with them about it. I think I talked to my aunt about it um, because we have always had a really open relationship, you know, that she's that auntie, the cool auntie. And so, but she was just really good at listening during that time and just saying, it's going to be okay. You know, we're working it out there. She, she's the one who found us that new place that we ended up moving into. And she's always been there. Family's always kind of been there to help, but, and we're lucky for that because not everybody has that, especially in a very transient place like Raleigh. I remember having conversations with my siblings, like with my sister, who's three years younger. She was 15 at the time. You know, and then it just kind of cascades downward from there as far as ages. So you can, I only wanted to go so deep with them. I felt the need to protect them, whether or not that was my role or even something I could actually do. I think it's just as an oldest child, that's how I felt. And so, yeah, it was a really kind of lonely, really frustrating time. But again, now I understand that anything can get a tenant kicked out (laughs) of their house. It doesn't always have to be being behind in in rent or anything like that. And so now I'm like much more understanding of that situation. And and it never happened again, completely isolated incident. It never happened before and it never happened again, but it only takes one time. (laughs) That will, being evicted will change your life. Just that, just once that one time is enough to, to make you a, a bit of a different person than you were before. Have you had conversations with your siblings, maybe in adulthood about that experience of being evicted? I think we all just knew it was very confusing. It was very upsetting and unsettling. Thankfully, we were not homeless in the most explicit sense because we had my aunt's home to go to, but not having our own home anymore as kids was really strange. I think I got it. My sister, who's three years younger than me, got it. Maybe the next one in line, but then she was like 12. And then the other three were like elementary school or babies. And so they didn't really get it. They just thought we were hanging out with our aunt for (laughs) a couple of weeks. And we were just taking such great care of her. Like, I think family would come by and hang out. And my family is such that even when things are very, very, very hard and difficult, and I think a lot of families are like this, but we just try to keep things as normal as possible, you know? And so family dinners, you know, continued and people came by and we played and we played in my aunt's backyard and they all just kind of rallied around us kids trying to keep it from feeling like a crisis (laughs) and kind of making it feel like almost like a trip we were taking or or something like that. I'm thankful for that because we were so young that it would have been hard to have all of the details out there for all of us to just take in and not understand what any of it means. So I really appreciate it that from my aunt, all the family that was in town that helped during that time. People are going to be listening to this podcast who maybe aren't aware of the relationship between tenants and landlords, or maybe they don't quite understand the severity of the situation when it comes to evictions in our country in general, especially now yeah. during COVID, uh, obviously is a, it's a big, big deal. What would you hope that they took away from your story as they think about evictions today? What I'd hope, first of all, is to not assume that the one being evicted did anything wrong. Because in many states in the United States, it doesn't take that. Don't assume that the person being evicted did anything wrong. And the second thing is, if you really want to understand better what's happening, because it is very complicated and and it's different from state to state, reach out to your local fair housing board, which every county or city typically has one, um, which is associated with the housing authority. And also reach out to any local housing activists that are in the area. 
legal aid is another person to reach, you know, another group to reach out to in your area. And that's how you're going to get information on how, what the state of the situation is in your area, in your town or city or whatever. That's where you can get, get the best information, the easiest information to understand. So you don't get bogged down by a lot of jargon and also how you can make a difference in the situation in your area. The, the, you know, they'll give you really easy steps to advocate for folks who are caught in really kind of a, a nasty cycle, depending on where you live, um, of housing instability. You've been listening to the Common Good Podcast, a conversation about the significance of place, eliminating economic isolation, and the structure of belonging. This is a poem from Mary Oliver. It's called coming home. When we are driving in the dark on the long road to Provincetown, when we are wary, when the buildings and the scrub pines lose their familiar look, I imagine us rising from the speeding car. I imagine us seeing everything from another place, the top of one of the pale dunes or the deep and nameless fields of the sea. And what we see is a world that cannot cherish us but which we cherish. And what we see is our life moving like that along the dark edges of everything, headlights sweeping the blackness, believing in a thousand fragile and unprovable things. Looking out for sorrow, slowing down for happiness, making all of the right turns right down to the thumping barriers to the sea, the swirling waves, the narrow streets, the houses, the past, the future, the doorway that belongs to you and me. As we return, our producer, Joey, continues the conversation by asking Courtney a question about home, place, and belonging. You know, the thing, I I work in Cincinnati with high schoolers a lot, and we create spaces for high schoolers to tell stories. The overarching theme is belonging. We always use a four-letter word as an entryway into the conversation. And so a lot of times we use the word home Mm. and uh, then we, we ask people to tell stories about places where they experience belonging or safety or so often the kids that we're working with say something like we've, I've moved every year for the past 10 years or Mm. I've been to six different schools. And, and so it's, it's, I think it's difficult. It's really difficult for them to articulate a place where they feel safe because it's been so unstable in terms of their, of their places. The thing in your story that I was struck by was the role that your aunt and her home played in this, as this place of stability. I just imagine in different situations, it could have been a really different story without that person, that place. Yeah, absolutely. It would have been different. I mean, that's home is family for me. It's always been that because like you said, the physical sense of, of a, a building to which we own and call home and grow up in didn't really exist for me. Mm -hmm. We moved around a lot, mainly to do with finances. I'm assuming we always stayed in the same school. My parents were very adamant about us staying in the same schools, stayed in the same church. Those stable places were not necessarily the, the, the four walls that we called home, but the families that we created, their school family, our church family, yeah. And of course, our, our biological family as well. But I get it. It is. It's weird. My husband grew up in the same house his entire life. You know, he yeah. was brought home to that house. And that's the house he left when we got married. And I have no clue what that's like. It's, it's still a, uh, just a, you know, a place where we differ so dramatically um, in the way we approach home, that word and that, that idea. How are, how are you all imagining the idea of home for your kids? Um, that's a really good question. So now that we own the home that we're in, it's really interesting. So me and my family, my husband and my kids have moved around quite a bit as well, in different cities. And, and so now we're finally settled. And my daughter, who is six, she remembers moving around a lot. Mm-hmm. And I remember when we first moved into this house, she would just come out of her room and just say, you know, I'm so thankful we have a house. Like, we're, you know, this is our house. Mm-hmm. This is where we get to stay. And she was, I mean, at the time we moved in, she was four going on five. It's like such a mixture of feelings when you, when a child so young has a concept of like having moved around a lot, having been shuffled around. I'm living in places that were not great. 
really yucky stories of like the apartment that we lived in when we first moved to Raleigh after we moved out of my aunt's house, <laughs> which we spent some time in when we were going between Raleigh and Winston-Salem. But after we finally settled in our own place in Raleigh, it was just such a rundown place. And she remembers that. And she was only two and three. It's a bittersweet thing. And we, and we do want to make this home feel like home. But it's hard because sometimes I don't know how to do that making um, repairs and decorating and things feels very unnatural to me because I feel like, oh, well, I'm just going to be leaving soon anyway. So making home is hard. It's just like a learning thing. I'm watching my parents make their house home and that inspires me to, you know, push through those anxious feelings and, and invest in this space and making it beautiful. Thanks for listening. You can find more information about the Common Good Collective at commongood.cc. Be sure to check out Courtney's bio in the show notes. In the next episode, we'll move into discussing policies around the current eviction crisis in our country. The Common Good is hosted by me, Rabbi Miriam Turlenchamp, and produced by the amazing Joey Taylor with music from Jeff Moore.